Okay, um, last but definitely not least, a very flashy app that I hope to also soon be addicted to running around the streets of New York. Um, I would like to introduce Soapstone. Um, with innovations like the infinite scroll news feed, uh, sites like Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter seem to be pulling us away from the world more than connecting us to it. We wanted to develop a social media where users couldn't just sit on the toilet and flick through pictures of friends and family. <laughs> that doesn't really sound like a social experience to us. It just sounds kind of creepy. So for the past seven days, we've been developing Soapstone. Soapstone, which is a fancy word for chalk, is a location-based social media where users interact by posting and viewing each other's drops. Drops are pictures, text, or both, and users get to see each other's drops by being in a close proximity to them. When a user is within range, they get to click on it, comment on it, and get snaps. For a more in-depth view of the app, I'm going to give it over to David. Thanks, Jake. So here we have a map. On this map is a circle. Inside the circle, we have these Skittle-colored dots. Outside, there are diamonds as well. And each of these represents a user's drops. However, with the diamonds, you can't see each spot, each drop, unless you're physically within radius of it. Sometimes it can get a bit cluttered. So on the top right, we have a filter called following. With following, you can view each user's um, drop um, only if you're following them. Sometimes you can get even more cluttered, so we introduced a, a list view. We have a detailed information of each drop. So let's just go click on a drop. So that's a really cool picture. I like it. So let's give it a snap. And I'll give it a comment. Cool picture. <laughs> and now I'll hand it off to Pete to explain user profiles. Thanks, David. So from here, we can actually view Jake's profile by clicking on his avatar. This will take us to the user profile, our other main page. From here, we can see who Jake is following and who is following Jake. We can follow Jake if we aren't already by clicking on the follow button, and we can also unfollow him. From here, we're also able to view Jake's drops by clicking on the drops. This will bring us to a zoomed out view of Jake's drops. So it kind of puts us in a general idea of where we should walk towards to view Jake's drops. We can zoom out and see that Jake has dropped all across the world, <laughs> surprisingly. <laughs> from here, we would want to actually see what we can do. So we'll hit the center button on the right-hand side. This will bring us back to where we are currently. And this will give us what we can do. Um, so let's let's make a drop. Let's click the lower right hand button and make a new drop. We can enter text and take a picture. So with that, uh, we utilize Paperclip, which is a Ruby library which manages all of our image handling and the sizes. We upload that to S3 on Amazon. So as this is loading, uh, there we go. So now it should be on my profile. So let's go to my profile, which is on the upper, on the middle button. So as you can see, this is very similar to Jake's profile, but there are a few more features that we have. So I can see all my drops that I've made recently, or even in the, in the past. I can click on that drop and view who has snapped it and who has commented on it. One other feature we have is the find users feature. We can enter in a few letters and it'll autocomplete. Let's try to find Matt. So Matt will take it from now to describe the technologies we utilized. So um, a lot of the features you've just seen, like uh, viewing a drop, details, and um, the autocomplete search, we need to get data back from our server to display on the page. Uh, we use, to do this without reloading, 
we use Ajax to send JSON back and forth to our Ruby on Rails backend server. By only sending the data we need, we can ensure a snappy user experience. Um, since it's a single page experience, we have a lot of JavaScript on the front end. Rather than you try to um, figure out a new JavaScript framework, we uh, wrote our own uh, MVC pattern JavaScript code from scratch for the front end. We also wanted our app to look great. So we use Yahoo's uh, pure CSS framework for its responsive grid and built custom CSS on top of that, inspired by Google's material design guidelines. Um, our app handles a lot of geolocation queries, like find me all the drops in the database within five miles. So to do that, we need a um, technology on the back end to handle those kind of uh, queries. Uh, originally, we used a database extension called uh, PostGIS, but this was uh, generally more complex than we needed, and it was a lot of hassle to set up, and there was extra cost to um, hosting it. So we explored a little more and found a uh, plugin called GeoKit that had just the features we needed and was easier to use. And now to talk about how we handle geolocation on the front end, here's Jake. So if you've been paying attention, you might have realized that all of the drops blink. And if you've been bored and counting, you'll have realized that they blink every 30 seconds. What that blinking represents is the front end needing to go to the back end to refresh the drop data. So every 30 seconds, the browser finds its location using HTML5's built-in geolocation feature. It then takes that latitude and longitude and hands it to the back end rail system. That we then query the database, like Matt was talking about, and we get a bunch of drop data. That drop data is then given back to the front end. Because we use JavaScript in the front end, we're able to iterate over that data very quickly and many times. So twice a second, we iterate over all of the drops that we get, and we assess their distance from where we currently are. This means that the front end can evaluate a drop's clickability. So as you walk down the street, or as you're driving in a car, and drops come within range, the browser turns them on, and they take that scale shape. Similarly, as drops exit your field division, they go hollow and unclickable. Uh, but this isn't how we always used to do it. Uh, before, we had to go to the back end every five seconds and ask for two pieces of information. One was all the clickable drops, and the other was all the non-clickable drops. This resulted in our app being you know, very flashy. The, the drops would blink every five seconds, and it would look like a skilled color grave. Um, that was bad for two reasons. It was good for that reason. <laughs> Uh, the first reason it was bad is because we relied very heavily on the back end of doing all of the work. So because the front end couldn't realize which drops were clickable and which weren't, if you were walking down the street and more drops came within your field of vision, they wouldn't actually be seen as clickable until five seconds expired and the back end gave us the more updated view. This results in a very laggy five second like gap period where you see that drops are near you, but you can't, uh, you can't click on them. The other reason this was bad was because if this app ever got a lot of users, that means that every five seconds, we'd be making two queries to the database, and that would overload our back end. We still have to you know, blink the drops every 30 seconds, but for more on our to-do list, I'm going to hand it over to Peter. Thanks, Jake. So as you can see, we provided a very clean mobile view. We would want to, in the future, make this very usable on desktop as well as on tablet. Further down the line, I think we would want to make this out of the browser and a native iOS app. And as our user base grows, we would want to make the database queries much more efficient. Um, and the main goal of this app was to get users out of their seats and up and out in the world, making drops and viewing other people's drops. Okay. So there's always going to be things that we can do to improve this app. There's always going to be more user experience and more cool features. Given that we only had eight days, I'm incredibly proud of what we were able to do. We tackled a lot of difficult technologies like JavaScript, dealing with JavaScript and MVC, annoying things like S3 and just stuff like that. And I'm incredibly proud of our final result. We made it a clean and elegant and very fun app. And I had this idea before coming to DVC, and watching it go from pipe dream to reality was really just an amazing experience, and I really can't thank my team enough. So thanks for listening. I'm Jake. And I'm David. And I'm Peter. And I'm Matt. And, and social, social should, should be, be social. social. <laughs>
Oh yeah, that's actually exactly the opposite uh, latitude and longitude of where we are currently. <laughs> so <laughs> right. yeah, straight to the earth. <laughs> Uh, what API did you use for the, for the map itself? Oh, we used the Google Maps API. It was actually easy. Like, there was a lot of good documentation, but you had to find it. So it's kind of straightforward in some situations, but other times they, like, assign objects to certain things. Other times you need to call function calls. It's all written online, but you have to be very specific about the question you're asking because making a marker and changing a marker would seem like they would be, like, the same thing, but it's actually, like, two separate things. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned that like in the future you'd like to move to native. I'm not sure if you did any spiking on that at all, but I saw you on an iPhone here. Would that mean you'd have to migrate to Apple Maps if you made it native on iPhone, you know? We actually didn't look at that. Um, yeah. I'm uh, sorry, uh, I can't hear you. Yeah, uh, uh, we really didn't take that into consideration. Um, walking around New York, we actually ping our database every 30 seconds, not two seconds. We refresh that data twice every second, which I may have said incorrectly when I was presenting. But we actually only go to the database once every 30 seconds. <coughs> yeah. Okay. So we query the database based off of created at. So if there were no other points around where you made that point, it would probably be there forever. But if there were points like in New York and like Times Square, all of those points would be visible. But as you walk over them and that deal with that little circle goes over them, we limit that circle to 30 points. So you only see inside your circle of vision the 30 newest points created. If I wanted to go to you as a user, I would be able to see all of your points no matter where they are in the world. But if I click the all feature, it's within five miles. And inside that circle, it's only 30, uh, 30 newest pins. Okay, big round of applause for the